Hey guys, it's Raven here, and I have a little bit of a different sort of video for you today. Lately I've been working on a lot of replay casts and gameplay commentaries, and I really wanted to get back to the tutorial roots of my channel. And so this video here today is kind of an attempt to do that. What this is, is my decks. It's how I build my decks, why I put the units I put in them, and really deck building is the most important, or at least one of the most important uh, aspects of war game, and it's also one of the most poorly understood aspects as well. There's just so many uh, stats and, and values, and a lot of people don't necessarily know which stats to pay attention to and which ones not to, or, or what the numbers even mean. And really, I mean, if you look on the forums or online, it, there's a lot of bad decks out there, and there's just so many opinions and so much noise, it can be really hard to... I guess sift through it all and that's kind of what I'm attempting to do here today and in subsequent videos so I, and I I should add the disclaimer here that there's just because there is a lot of different ways to make decks and so much variety in what you can do two really great players can have completely different decks and both be successful so in a, in a lot of ways there's no wrong well there is a wrong way but there's not necessarily one right way to do things and while I do think my decks are the right way they're not the only way and good players can differ so I'm not trying to say that these decks are the best or whatever so with that said I guess we'll get right to it first I wanna actually show you my deck organization this is pretty cool see I got all my decks organized by national decks with kinda historical names like this is my East German Airborne, motorized, mechanized, armored. And no, I, I really probably haven't used even 80% of these, but they're there just in case Eugen ever decides to make them viable. You'll notice I, I don't have any coalitions. I don't have any mixed decks. I'm a national deck only player. I'm a conquest only player as well. So if you happen to prefer destruction, I, I can respect that preference, but my decks may not necessarily be the most optimized for what you're looking for. They should work fine, but there might be a few minor issues that, that wouldn't work as well for destruction, so bear that in mind if you are a destruction player. But anyways, uh, today we're going to be talking about my USSR deck. And uh, I really don't... A lot of players will make certain decks for different maps or permutations of strategies on different maps and I, I'm really not about that. This this is my general competitive USSR deck that I play in almost all my competitive USSR games. I don't change it much based on the map or game I'm playing or who I'm playing. This, what you see is what you get. Now that doesn't mean that it doesn't change overall. I changes quite a bit just over time. Like last week there was several cards different next week there will also be several cards different so there are definitely changes and really your deck should be a living breathing organism in some way and if it's not you're, you're doing it wrong frankly you should always be analyzing replays updating your deck and, and so on so let me get right to it you can see I have five uh, logistic slots a lot of players they'll get away with four or even if you are maybe in a team game, you can get away with three. Like if you're playing a 3v3 on a small map, you don't need each player to have two commands or two CV cards. But like I said, this is general deck. I use it in 1v1s, 4v4s, 10v10s, anything. And so it kind of needs to cover a lot of bases. You can see I take a command infantry and a lightly armored command vehicle. Both are pretty affordable and somewhat numerous. I think just having seven CVs, that's kind of a sweet spot for the minimum you need in the average Conquest game. Uh, I like infantry CVs because you can use them, you do a lot of things with them. They're really easy to hide, they're real stealthy. But you can also, uh, for example, a lot of people talk about getting recon behind enemy lines and sniping CVs, and yeah, you can do that, but you can also walk command CVs behind or command infantry guys behind enemy lines too and get to a zone that maybe they thought was safe and they're not don't have well guarded and then sneak into it and neutralize it they have no idea where to even begin looking for your CV or 
they may not even notice if it's in the back lines. It, it's a strategy I've done several times, and it's it's rare you can pull that off, but it's an interesting thought. And even just you can put these guys in buildings and then shift them around so they can avoid bombing and artillery. They're, they're a pretty effective CV, also immune to cluster munitions. And this this is just light, amphibious, fast, lightly armored. Uh, I don't really like the Jeep CV. It's pretty popular because it's so cheap and you get seven of them in a card, but they only have five HP and they don't have any armor, so basically any stray artillery shell or whatever will really kill them. And then that cost effectiveness goes out the window when you need to pay 100 points more for a second CV when your 120 point BRDM 2U might have survived. Now, if you're going to take something like a command tank, which is distinguished by its high top armor laying it, survive artillery and bombardments a lot easier then it, it makes sense to do command jeeps with tanks because the armor and low availability of the tank is then offset by the jeep and the overall scheme of your deck and that does work I do that in some of my decks but for this deck I do command infantry and a light APC CV <clears throat> so and you get to supply and generally it pays to do the highest or the let me say the most expensive supply vehicle. And that's because, for example, if we compare the Ural 4320, which I picked, to the Ural 3750, the Ural 4320, and I'll, I'll actually have the math up in an annotation so you can see it a little more clearly, but you get nine 4320s per card times 1,100 liters of supply capacity. That's uh, over, <laughs> it's over 9,000 uh, supplies. Uh, per card, so this whole card of nine comes with more than nine thousand supplies. Whereas the Ural 4320, you get eleven per card, or no, excuse me, the Ural 3750, you get eleven per card at 800 liters of supply. That's only 8800 supply. So on its face, you get more value per points out of the more expensive uh, supply vehicle, and you get more supplies overall. Same thing with the uh, supply helicopters. The MI6, the MI26, again, you get overall more supply per helicopter per point. It's just a better value because I, I guess it's like buying in bulk. You can really see this uh, at play if you compare like the American Hemp with the American Cargo Truck. I, I never take the Cargo Truck, always take the Hemp. And lastly, um, a FOB. This is actually the most supply efficient unit in terms of points. Uh, excuse me, in terms of supply divided by points, that, that's how you can determine the efficiency. So you get the most supply per points in the FOB, but of course that's taking units off the front lines in the initial engagement, so you have to buy it at the start. But generally I think a FOB is a pretty good investment. Getting that supply line up and keeping your artillery rearmed, it's pretty important. So now we go to infantry, and um, first, first we have the Gornostroki. And what this card is here is really a helicopter card. I, sometimes I have VDV in this helicopter, which is the MI-8 MTV. You can see it's got 20 rockets with 4 HE and it's armored for only 30 points. That's only 5 points more than the base MI-8. Real good value. You should, you should really take it. I, I love it a lot. It really Those rockets will help you kill stuff and suppress it so much better than the weaker rockets that are more numerous on other models of helicopter. But back to the infantry, um, right now I have Gornostroki, and I don't like that they're not shock, and I don't like that they have the crappy PKM machine gun at their 30 points, but I do like their high AP and their medium range, and so I kind of have a love-hate relationship with these guys. I'll play five games where I'll just never use them, and I'm on the cusp of taking them out of my deck, and then suddenly I have one game where they're just so vital, and the terrain is just perfect for them, and oh, I'll never take them out of my deck, I'll never even think of it, but... Right now they're in, and next week they might be out. It's just how it goes. You know, decks evolve. Then we got Motorstroke 90 and the BMP3, and I want you to look at this card and notice that the Motorstroke are 15 points, and the BMP3 is 35 points. That means that the transport is more than double what the infantry squad is. So that means, are you buying this card for the infantry? And the answer is no. You're buying it for this this vehicle. Pretend the Moshogi aren't even there. This is its own self-contained unit with a 
Harkin missile that's really long range, a uh, high powered HE cannon, and an auto cannon. And I use this in support of tanks as a kind of uh, just support vehicle for sniping stuff with its Arkin or helping deal with rushes of cheaper units with its auto cannon and such. It's really effective at that, but just in terms of how you use IVs and how you think of it, like this is what you're buying is is this vehicle. The, the Moto Strokey, they're they're an added bonus. They're a dismountable extra for taking the BMP3. So if you're taking this to get the Moto Strokey in combat, I I respectfully would argue that you're doing it wrong because that's again the the Moto Strokey only cost they cost less than half of what the BMP3 does. That that's just so inefficient if you're trying to use these guys just as infantry. Um, and then moving on, we got VDV. VDV-90 are great. They're my favorite USSR unit. And the reason why, and I guess their closest competitor is probably the Morskaya Pihota, which are up here. You see they're both 20 points, and they have the same guns, the same uh, LMG, the same assault rifle. Difference being the Morskaya Pihota are 15 strength, so they have 50% more men per squad than the VDV. Which is nice, and if you're going to do town brawling, I guess that's an advantage, but the problem with the Morskaya Pihota is that they can't fulfill the most important role of an infantryman. And what that is, is deterring armored vehicles from entering forests and cities. And the reason why is because they have a 17 AP rocket launcher, which means it'll only do one damage to the frontal armor of most NATO medium to heavy tanks. The VDV conversely have the Vampire, which is 24 AP. It is literally the best rocket launcher in the game. Very powerful. One shots anything in the side armor, if I recall, and does two damage to most tanks in the NATO lineup. Very good, very good value, especially if you take them in the BTRD transport, which I do. You can see here it's got two front and two side armor for only five points. It has a quad machine gun, which fires at 4,000 rounds per minute. That is insane. It, it'll literally tear stuff up, and it makes up for some of the VDV's weakness in infantry combat. Cause just because this machine gun is so good at suppression, so good at killing, that it can help the VDV deal with enemy infantry while the VDV use their vampires on tanks. I really love these guys. They're my main line infantry. And my last slot is Moto Strokey 90. And ever since the they're in the BTR 80, and ever since the BTR 80 was buffed to only 15 points, I feel like it's a pretty good value. It's uh, it's got a decent auto cannon. It was buffed to, or it has 20% accuracy rather than the usual 10% accuracy on the KPVTs. Two front, two side armor. Very uh, very good speed. It's really a great cavalry unit, and that's kind of what I use my Moto Strokey for, is fast reinforcement. They're really not the best. I wish that they costed 25 points instead of 30, because my VDV costs 30. I think the Moto Strokey are much worse than the VDV. They should cost less, but overall I have them in my deck, and they've proved themselves. And I, I like having that option of a fast wheeled infantry to reinforce positions quicker than, than the VDV could in their slower BTRDs. So, there's probably a lot of questions you might have about the units I didn't take, and I'll just briefly cover them. Uh, the Spetsnaz are very popular. I feel they're overrated. I feel they're too specialized, too expensive, and I, in a deck with five infantry slots, I just I don't feel they have a good role. Likewise, I don't take ATGM infantry like the Conquerors because... Uh, ever since the first DLC when ATGMs were bugged and then they kind of half fixed it, ATGMs have been very unreliable, in my opinion. And besides that, I mean, these guys are only two, two men in strength, so they die to everything. They die to stray artillery shells, they die to bombardments. Something sees them, one shot will kill them, and you only get seven of them. And, I mean, is this really worth it? Is this really worth one of your infantry cards? And... I used to have them in my deck, I just I was never taking them, I was never calling them out, and I realized, no, it's really not. And for that matter, when you're USSR, I mean, I have the BMP3, I have my tanks, and everything in my deck has an ATGM on it, so why do I need infantry with ATGMs? And finally, as far as um, Iglas go, now Iglas are actually, at least the Iglans, actually one of the best man pads in the game, because it has the all-important 5HE, which is 
the threshold you need to cross to two-shot enemy planes. But they did raise the um, flight, the flight altitude of uh, ASFs and a lot of other planes. So manpads aren't as effective as they once were. They are nice, but my other A is so efficient. It's kind of a matter of, um, you know, do do I really need this? Is it worth a, one of my critical five infantry slots? And again, I I just don't feel the answer is yes. I, I can't justify them. So let's go ahead and talk support. Um, in this, and I feel five support cards is pretty important for USSR. A lot of people don't do five, but I have the Strela 10M. It's a very, uh, it's a very workmanlike, a very common packed AA. It's 50 points. It's a great value. It's got that important 5 HE, good accuracy, decent range, <clears throat> and um, 12 missiles. That's really important because. That 12 missiles ensures it's just very reliable and very um, sustainable in the field versus something like, say, the Strela 1M, which only has four missiles. I mean, this thing will fire its, like, a couple missiles and it'll be done, and you'll have a useless 30-point unit that has absolutely no combat value, whereas the Strela 10M can fight even in prolonged engagements and continue to keep your AA net even after several attack runs by helicopters or planes, and... Just a very solid unit, and pretty much every pack deck has it, and uh, I really like it. Uh, then I have the Tunguska. Tunguska is also a really effective unit. It's got a uh, radar gun that's very powerful. I believe the most powerful radar AA gun in the game. But then it also has this really long range uh, anti-helicopter missile with 7 HE, really high accuracy. It's just a great area of denial weapon against helicopters. And again, it's pretty good sustainability. It's got the 8 uh, eight missiles, uh, 2,000 rounds in the gun, but when you fire it, 2,777 rounds per minute. Those, those go pretty quick, though. Um, I want to compare the Tunguska very briefly to the Tor which is another popular option, and I feel that they have a lot of overlap in role in terms of being good at killing helicopters, uh, somewhat similar price range, similar damage on their missile. And the reason I take the Tunguska over the Tor, despite a lot of people preferring the Tor, is because uh, if you look at the Tor, it's, it's missile against helicopters, it has less range of the Tunguska, less accuracy, same HE, and it's radar. So if a seed plane's in the air, you can't use this. The radar has to be off until the seed plane turns away and you can fire at it. Whereas the Tunguska is very, very self-sustaining. You don't have to baby the missile. You can leave the missile on because it's not radar. And it'll perform better against helicopters, whereas the gun will actually perform, in my opinion, better than the Tor against planes, provided they get in the range. So since the Tunguska is so versatile, and since in my mind these two units have a lot of roll overlap, I prefer the Tunguska over the Tor. And that also leaves me with the book, which is my radar AA of choice, which I think a lot of people would compare to the Tor, but because its range is so much higher, it's got higher accuracy, uh, more HE, I, just, I feel the book is more of a has better synergy as having a long-range AA piece, more of a strategic asset where if you get a couple of them up with good uh, supply unit coverage, they'll really do a lot of good work with the Tunguska being my more mid-range asset and my Strela 10M being close range. I feel this is a better combination than trying to do it all with the Tor because I don't think the Tor really excels at, in either of its roles compared to the Tunguska and the book. So that's just my preference. A lot of players do love the tour. And um, then I guess we have artillery. I have the Vasilik. Vasilik's a really nice mortar. Uh, you'll see its direct competitor is the Podnos, which, uh, let me compare them, which is 10 points less. It's got pretty much the same stats except one more rate of fire and 15 less, uh, less, less shells in the gun. And so you'd say, oh, you know, 10 points less, take the Podnos. But what the stats don't tell you is the Vasilik, and you can test this out. The Vasilik actually fires its rounds in quick succession, so boom, 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 boom. Whereas the Podnos is more boom, boom, boom. But what that means is that the Vasilik will get its rounds on target quicker, and also more accurately just in the sake of 
the dispersion between shots is less so if you fire at a stationary target you have more chance of all your all your uh, shells hitting before the target's a chance to move I really like it it puts down smoke really quickly I would never trade the trade it for the pod nose and uh, yeah this is really really nice I love mortars I think everybody should use mortars and not enough people do you can see the alternatives to the Vasilic would be something like the Nona's, which are also very good. They're longer range, higher caliber, more damage, but they only carry 39 shells. And to me, it kind of goes back to self-sufficiency and sustainability, and they, they just don't have it. They'll run out of their shells too quickly. Whereas the Vasilic is carrying 100, and it can pretty much go the whole game without reloading, depending on how trigger-happy you are. And finally, we have uh, USSR Long Range Artillery. When it comes to Long Range Artillery, there's only three options, and those are the Mista, the Uragon, the Smirch. You don't take the Akatsias, you don't take the Gadadziks, or the Malkas, or the Peons, solely because all of these other options take a long time to fire, whereas the Mista the Uragon and the Smirch have what's called the advanced fire control, which means that they fire in six seconds. That's a huge advantage for artillery pieces, and one that you really can't pass up, no matter what the stats of these other guns might be. I personally take the Mista because I favor tube artillery for the more saturation effect compared to MLRS, which is rocket launchers, and their more burst of damage with than long recover times. Uh, I also have a friend who uses the Uragon a lot, so I kind of take the Mista just so I can complement him. Mista's, as far as long-range artillery guns go, it's actually probably the worst one of the... the worst of the best, basically. It's got decent range, decent dispersion, but it fires quickly, and its selling point is it's actually well-armored compared to other artillery, so it'll survive counter-battery better. Uh, again, I like it. It's not for smoking, it's for killing and stunning and suppressing. Another uh, second option for you would be the Uragon, which actually does really high damage for its missiles. Huge suppression, very effective tool at killing light stuff and just suppressing an area and stunning it to hell. Great choice. If I didn't have the mist, I'd probably have this, but it is kind of supply hungry. I personally would take it uh, upfitted because you can get three trained or two hardened, but if you're using three Uragons, it's really overkill and you're going to waste supplies, so I would only take two. Alternative, last alternative I should say, is the Smirch. Uh, I personally think it's a little overrated because um, it'll kill heavy tanks if you're fortunate and they don't move out of the way in time, but otherwise. The Uragon will kill light stuff just as well, if not better, plus kill infantry and stun, whereas the Smirch only suppresses. But all three of those options are very good. Like I said, I prefer the Mista. Uh, moving on to tanks, I only take four tank cards. A lot of people take five. I, I've never used more than this these number of tanks. Not since Airland Battle, where I had a game where I literally was down to one T-80U and two T-72 bases, but... That's the closest I've ever been to running out of tanks with four tank cards. I take the two super heavies, the BU and the UM. I personally prefer the BU. If I could get two cards of these, I probably would. But the UM is also a good complement to the BU because while it's not as well armored, it is faster. It has a much a more powerful, more accurate, longer range missile. And it used to have a better gun, but now the gun's the same. But it is kind of a, the UM is a kind of cavalry uh, fire support complement to my BU, which is more of a frontline tank. But both are excellent choices. I, I would take both just because I think super heavies are so important and so vital. And if you don't have one, you, you really get kind of screwed on the, on the front lines trying to stand against M1A2s and such. After that, I take the T-72B, which... I think is the Soviet tank that just offers the best combination of firepower and armor for the price. Uh, I really like this tank and you see there is a big gap between my 175 point UM and my 95 point uh, B 
and that's just because I, I don't think the intermediate Soviet tanks are very good. I've tried a lot of alternatives, the T-80A, T-80BV, T-64BV. I, I can't look at these all in the video because there's just too many, but just to compare the B to the BV, for 35 more points you get basically two AP and two front armor. Is that really worth it? I mean, this is a nice tank, but compared to what you get with the B, I, I don't think that the increase is, is worth the increase in cost. Uh, my role for the B is really a, a helper to the UM and the BU. I use the B, uh, see it's got a long range gun, decent accuracy, good missile, it, it's just great fire support for my two heavy, or my, excuse, my four heavy tanks which are more on my front line, and then the bees help them deal with uh, lighter vehicles or help even damage heavies if they can get close enough or use their missiles. And finally I have the T-72A which I want to address because a lot of people prefer the T-72, just the base, your all version T-72. If you compare these two, the T-72A has a longer range gun which means that effectively it has 50% accuracy compared to the T-72's 35% when firing at the same range. Because remember, for each 175 meter increment you have on a gun, your accuracy goes up by 5% and your AP goes up by 1. So you can also say effectively the A has 15 AP to the T-72's 13. Uh, more rounds per minute, very important for tanks. Two more front armor. Uh, medium optics which isn't a big deal but it's also nice I, I, th I feel that for only 10 points the T-72A is a much better value I use it for one of two things either as a forest brawler because at, uh, at forest range which is 350 meters maximum this thing is going to have 20, 21 AP something like that uh, very high damage for a 45 point tank with decent armor Excuse me. Let me. Click on this one. No, this will, this will, have, this will be more like 22, 23 AP with uh, decent armor. Just very good value for only 55 points. The other role I use it for is just to give bulk to my uh, tank pushes. If it's out in the open, I, I just need more numbers. These guys will survive uh, most NATO, at least one hit from uh, most NATO missiles or tanks and that's that's critical being able to survive a hit and have to take two hits to kill just basically doubles the strength of my force in terms of uh, survivability which is important for standing in front of the UMs and the BUs while they kill stuff um, I'm very happy with this tank lineup I haven't changed it for a long time and I've tried a lot of different things but th this is what I've settled on for now Recon I have the BRM-1K, which is an exceptional optics BMP-1, essentially. I have it for its exceptional optics because there really is a huge difference between exceptional optics and very good optics. If you ever get a chance to test this, like uh, drive a very good optics vehicle at something and see how far away it detects it and then drive it away and check with the exceptional optics, you'll be amazed at the difference. And so if I want to take an exceptional optics ground vehicle, then it's either this or the Plamia, which is a, a Jeep. And just because the BRM-1K is armored and I, I like it because it keeps up with my tanks well and it survives stray artillery shells, so you're definitely not taking it for, for the Grom because that gun's absolutely terrible, but it's just for looking at stuff and it does that job pretty well. I also take the Spetsnaz Gru, which are a pretty badass uh, recon squad and they come in a BTR 80A this transport here which you can see it's a fast wheeled transport with uh, a good auto cannon I actually use this unit for much the same role people would probably use the BRDM3 which is actually a you can see it's a recon basically a recon BTR 80A which is what these guys are riding in so for only 50 points which is 5 points more I get better optics because the GRU have very good optics. I get a dismountable badass recon squad and then I get a, a vehicle with the same uh, capabilities as the BRDM3. There's really no no contest to it in my mind. Uh, I use these kind of as a forward deployment unit that I get one or two of them to rush ahead of my force and 
either uh, find a way through enemy lines or secure critical territory, and then later they turn more into hunter-killer squads that I send kind of to unexpected places of the map and try and find soft targets. Uh, then we have the MI-2. It's just a 40-point cheap recon helicopter. Uh, the reason I have it is because it's just, just to have really cheap eyes. Recon helicopters are really maneuverable, and it allows me to balance off the high balance out, excuse me, the high cost of my last card, which is the KA-52 Recon Akula. This thing I notice I take it up vetted, and the reason why is because not only does higher veterancy help recon units with detecting units, and uh, more identifying units, like rather than having a blank uh, icon with a question mark, it'll tell you what the unit is quicker. But it also has seed missiles, and it, when I upfed it, taking the higher veteran C makes these that much more accurate, and that's my, that much more dependable, because you only get two of them, and if you can land uh, two seed missiles and take out an enemy, the pair of enemy Gepard Flak Panzers, then that, that's just a great asset. It's very sneaky, it's got stealth, it's got exceptional optics, it's fast. The autocan's not that useful because it's mounted on the hull, so the the helicopter has to do kind of acrobatics to point it at the enemy. Uh, it's also got iglas, which are nice, but I really wouldn't use this helicopter as a dedicated anti-air helicopter. It's just too too expensive for that and too valuable to risk in that role. It's kind of a extra self-defense bonus, in my view. And then we got vehicles. Vehicles is really the kind of miscellaneous section in war game. This is where you put the points go to die. <laughs> Extra points. It, this is where but at least with the USSR they actually have a lot of interesting options and I think more so than anyone else frankly. Um, the units I pick in particular are the BMPT. This is an armored infantry assault vehicle I call it. It's got a grenade launcher, a powerful uh, high explosive gun, and a powerful auto cannon, combined with 15 front armor. Good speed, good autonomy. It's a very good unit. I love it as a fire support unit in forests or to help attack cities where it'll just decimate infantry and then also be able to deal with most light tanks by stunning it with a grenade launcher and then killing it with an auto cannon very useful unit. I love it. I, I would never take it out of my deck, probably. Uh, my other unit, well, before I get to that, let me just say that the BMPT has some kind of alternatives you can take, such as the Flame Tanks or the Afghanski, which is a, basically a Shilka Beryusa without a radar. It's just a fire support gun. And these Flame Tanks obviously fire flamethrowers. These three, the Flame Tanks, the Afghanski, and the BMPT, kind of have a similar role. And I've tried having the Flame Tanks and the Afghanski in my deck, but I've just, I found myself always saving up for the BMPT because it was just so useful and so more versatile that I, I just couldn't justify these units. I didn't find them useful enough. Now in my Eastern Bloc National decks, I do have Flame Tanks, so you'll, you'll, you will see those if I ever show you those decks, but the purpose of my USSR deck, they just don't really work for me. And that's why I don't have them. Uh, and then I have the Buratino. This is what I do have, and that's a uh, basically a rocket launcher that fires napalm rockets mounted on a T-72 chassis. And it's a unit I probably don't use often enough to really justify it being in my deck, but when I need it, I'm so glad I have it, because it's just, it's just a a hammer to really break up defenses and just hammer assaults and it's very powerful at clearing cities and forests and stunning stuff and it's a perfect vehicle in preparation for a major attack and combined with a Yurigan or a Mystic can really just tear apart some defenders if you use it in the opening stages of your advance so it's another of those units that I probably go five games without using it and just when I'm thinking about taking it out of my deck, I say, oh no, and I have a really good game and with it, and it, it has to stay. Very quickly, and I know this video is getting kind of long, I apologize, but it's probably my favorite most used deck, so I have a lot to cover, and I'll, I'll try and make future videos a little more streamlined. 
But I want to talk about some other popular alternatives in the USSR vehicle tab, and that is the Norov, which is basically a tank destroyer. It does have high rate of fire and decent accuracy, but only a medium range gun, low AP, and virtually no armor. And so for that reason, I know a lot of people like this gun, but I, w I would rather pay 20 points more to get a T-72A, which has essentially a, a equivalent gun with just different stats, but much more armor, much more versatile. I, I just don't see a real niche for this weapon. And the other choice that's really popular is the Zalo, and full disclosure, I hate the Zalo. I think it's useless, I think it's completely overrated. I, I would never take this in my deck, having tried it several times. It's got 20 rate of fire, which they buffed it up from 10 quite a while ago, and that kind of led to a resurgence in the Zalo, but I just feel its accuracy is so low, and its AP is so low. Uh, bad armor can, can only barely fire on the move. I just think that it doesn't have a very good role. And if you want a good cavalry tank, I can show you the AMX-10, which is a French cavalry tank. Now that thing is quality, but th this thing is just... I think the 20 rate of fire is too much of a gimmick, and I don't think it's got a good place in really any deck except maybe an airborne deck, because it's an airborne vehicle. But a lot of good players use them. Amber T uses them, and... Well, good players can differ, I guess. Um... Moving on to helicopters, I take the Mi-24V, which is armed with eight Iglas. Of course, I like that it's got a Yak uh, gun, which is very fast firing, good at killing helicopters. You can see here, it's the gun is rotating, like on on the front. What that means is that, uh, unlike hull-mounted helicopter weapons, it doesn't need to be pointing straight at a target to fire it. This is a huge advantage with target acquisition and and getting able, being able to fire it quickly rather than having your helicopter do acrobatics to point at the enemy. I will say I don't do very many helicopter rushes, so this is more of a unit to defend against helicopter rushes, and it does that role pretty well. Uh, my other choice is the Mi-24 VP, and I love this helicopter. As you can see, it's got the kind of uh, oscillating turret on the front for its gun, which means it also does not have to be pointing directly at a target to acquire it. It's actually an auto cannon, Decent accuracy for an auto cannon. Really nice rate of fire. Good range. It's got these very powerful 2HE rockets and a big load of them. It's got 80. And ever since they uh, upgraded this to having the Kokon M's, which are 22 AP uh, ATGMs, I've really felt this is the best combination of attack helicopter and tank buster. And really that fits with my helicopter doctrine, because I, I use this helicopter more as support, like suppressing infantry or tanks, rather than sending it at, at like Leopard 2A5s, trying to kill them with missiles, because I, I generally don't find that that works very well. And uh, I just want to show the alternative, like the Mi-28 here, which is 30 more points, you get arguably a more effective autocannon, you get more powerful uh, rockets but at the cost of only 10 instead of 80. I don't really like that. And you get these missiles which there's 16 of them but they're only 22 AP just like the Kokon M and only a little bit more accurate so I just for a much more specialized helicopter that frankly doesn't do its role any better than the Mi-24 VP does I, I don't see the Mi-28 as having any value. That's why I prefer the uh, VP. The only other one that you could really consider is the Akula, which is a decent helicopter. It actually does have high AP on its missiles. It's got stealth. It's got the nice Iglas for defending itself. Uh, I personally just think it's too expensive. 150 is... Mm, I, I don't really like that. And again, this is more of a focused tank-busting helicopter. And I, Like I said, I don't use my helicopters for that. So it's the VP for me, and I've been very, very happy with this. I, I love this helicopter, and I, I use it quite a bit. A lot of my starting deployments actually incorporated into it, and I've had a lot of success with that. So definitely try this one out. And uh, quickly, I'll go through planes. I take the uh, SU-27PU. You can see I've got a really nice, cool camo for it. I think it's... 
I can't think of who who it is now that does this, but check out the modding section for different skins. Very cool options there to just pimp out your units. Now, admittedly, the PU is kind of a high risk, high reward unit because you only get one of them per card. But you do get them at elite. They have excellent armaments. They're very reliable because they are elite with high accuracy weapons. So if you're careful with it, you can really wield it well and get a lot of value out of this. It gives you the insurance of having the very best. There is no blue four plane that outclasses it. There are some that equal it, but being able to fight the enemy Rafales and such on equal footing is just really important in my mind. And I, I do like this plane, though you have to be very, very careful with it. A good alternative is the SU-27S because you get a lot of similar capabilities for cheaper and you get two, uh, two per card, which is pretty good. It's, it's not quite top of the line, but it is very nice and it's a great alternative to the PU. Real quickly, <clears throat> the other popular, not so much any more popular, but especially in beta, the Yak-141. It's a nice plane, but it only has two of each type of missile, which means there's a lot of situations where you send it in an enemy and you'll fire all four of your missiles and have not killed your target, and then you're chasing it with a gun, and that, that's just not what you want to be doing with your Yak-141. You want to get in, fire your missiles, kill something, get out. And it's it's just not reliable enough in my mind, so I, I've tended to avoid it. So PU for me, but SU-27S is a good uh, alternative, I think. For Tank Buster, I do like the SU-25. It's just a very versatile. It's got uh, powerful missiles. It's got a, a AP gun that fires somewhat quickly, good range. And it's got rockets. Look at these um, 11 HE rockets. Those are basically like the bombs on some planes impacting when you hit a target. Um, very multi-role, but generally for killing tanks and sometimes rooting out infantry. Now, I have to say that while I like this plane, it's also not optimum. And that's that's kind of a problem with the Soviet plane lineup overall is... You have an alternative in the SU-25T, which you're paying 60 more points for weaker missiles, which you get 16 of them, and you're not even ever going to use 8 of them, probably. It's just, you're horribly overpaying for these side, these vimples you'll never use, missiles you'll never use, and it's just not a very effective plane. It's too much of a point sink, and it doesn't even do its job very well, because, like I said, it's only got... 26 AP on its missiles. It's going to take three of these, or excuse me, four of these missiles to kill an M1A2 Abrams from the front. And that's just too much for a 200 point attack plane. Now, a 200 point attack plane that is worth it is the SU 27M, which it's a very good plane. It's probably one of the only true multi role planes in the game because these Vimples are actually very long range, very accurate, very powerful. They, they can actually double as a ASF interceptor role, but mainly you get it for these high 30 AP damage uh, fire and forget rockets with this nice uh, range on them. This is a pretty good plan. The only problem is you only get one of them, and 200 points. And uh, I've I've used it several times, and I I like it, but it's just. If I had it in my deck, I would have four plane cards and only five planes between the PU the SU-27M, this and this, and I, I just decided that that was just too much, and I, I didn't want to go that hard and heavy. Besides, the SU-25 is a lot more affordable and, to some extent, like disposable. For bombers, I prefer the MiG-29S, and this this is a very firm preference. I, I would never abandon this plane. Unlike its competitors, it has really high ECM, 40% ECM, which means that more often than not, this plane gets to come home. And with your planes, you don't want to have a plane that only does one run. That's You're essentially paying 120 points for a missile if your plane only goes once and dies on the evac. And so just the reliability of this plane being able to go for run after run really just increases its value. The bombs itself are okay, the sidewinders it has are okay, they're more for self-defense than anything, but it does have a nice 
dual helicopter role if you're going to maybe go after a, <clears throat> a helicopter you see sneaking behind your lines. It's also fairly fast, so I do like this. The MiG-29S is a very good value in my book. An alternative to it would be the SU-24M, which, while it does have more but weaker bombs, it's just it's only 20% ECM, and this thing, it's nice, though the spread of the bombs is just really wide, so you won't tend to kill so much as maim anything you hit, and then it just doesn't have a tendency to make it home as much as the MiG-29S, so I, I tend to discount this. As I also discount the IL-102, which, while very powerful in the bomb department, is extremely slow, a very bad ECM, and that this is a flying coffin right here. So, given those three main choices, it's the MiG-29S entirely for me. Oh, and very quickly, MiG-27M is a, another attack uh, ATGM plane. I don't use it because I find it extremely unreliable. I've I've just I've seen so many instances where it fires both of these missiles and both of them miss, and it's, I just don't like it, so SU-25 for me. Seed plan, I prefer the MiG-25BM over the base SU-24. This is because, um, well, for one, you get one MiG-25BM per card, two SU-24. But you see those SU-24s, they only carry two missiles each, so combined, they actually have the same amount of missiles as one MiG-25BM which in any case has much longer range, much better accuracy, and actually decent ECM. It's got 50% ECM compared to 20% on the SU-24. So this thing can actually tangle with Patriots and IHawks pretty reliably, and just, it's a very reliable, very robust seed as long as you're careful with it, and really behind the Raven, it's probably one of the best uh, seed planes in the game. I really enjoy it. And I would definitely recommend trying it out over the SU-24. Uh, as you can see, I do not have anything in my naval category. I think naval is an unremittent disaster, and I have naval cards in virtually none of my decks, so <laughs> please don't ask me for naval decks or naval strategies, because I, frankly, I have no idea. But anyways, um, that's my USSR deck, and it's one I'm really proud of. I use it a lot, and I enjoy it a lot, and... I'll post a code for it in the description, but I, I would recommend everybody to take it and make it your own. Don't don't just eat my deck up because I said it's good. You know, everybody should have their own doctrine and their own play style, and use the units that work for you. And just just take my advice and my my guidance, not not just swallow my deck. <laughs> uh, it sounded a little wrong, <laughs> but anyways, um. Yeah, I, I would really like a lot of feedback on how this video went. I know it was very long, and I, I'm sorry for that. I, I wish it could have been a little shorter, but um, just how I can improve, maybe what, what deck to cover next time, uh, just gen general feedback, general comments on this. I uh, would really appreciate it. And as always, uh, like, comment, subscribe, and uh, well, thank you for watching. And I hope you liked my deck, and I hope you liked the video. And uh, that's all I have for today, so this is Raven signing off.